So this is the last part of Unit 8, Antipartum Nursing. It's Part 4. And this is about health promotion in pregnancy. And this is where we talk about a lot of our educational objectives. And you'll find that some of this is a little repetitious, um, so we won't have to dwell on it for very long. But our objectives um, cover the rest of the outline. We're going to describe the education needed by pregnant women to meet self-care needs. And that's um, things like uh, the normal discomforts of pregnancy and comfort measures for that. We're going to describe the education needed by pregnant women to identify potential complications, such as preterm birth or um, worsening preeclampsia. We're going to identify the purposes of childbirth education classes. We're going to identify food sources that provide the nutrients required for maternal nutrition during pregnancy, and some of that will be um, new information, but most of it will not. And we're going to identify indicators of nutritional risk during pregnancy. Okay, so the first thing we're going to learn about is education for self-care. Um, women need to know how to take care of themselves through pregnancy. And we can start by um, opening that discussion with the common discomforts of pregnancy. And generally women will be very open about what they're experiencing because it's new to them. And they want to get a feel for what's normal and what's not. Um, so we've already talked some about the common discomforts of pregnancy. Um, what we can tell people with is um, how to deal with them. So urinary frequency um, and sometimes that little bit of overflow incontinence that women get in the first and third trimester, we can remind them to do their Kegel exercises, um, tell them to empty their bladder as soon as it feels full and not to wait, um, try to avoid caffeine because that stimulates urination, and to reduce the fluid and take after dinner because otherwise they're up all night. Um, going to the bathroom and you know that's one of the more common discomforts of late pregnancy um, being up frequently for urination for the baby kicking for general insomnia and other discomforts okay so um, other things women complain of being fatigued again first and third trimester so teach them to get a full night's sleep without interruptions teach them to eat a healthy balanced diet because if they have good nourishment, um, they have a little bit more energy, particularly if they struggle with anemia, um, if you can get their iron counts up. If they need a nap in the afternoon and they can take one because, you know, hopefully if it's their first baby, they can nap. If it's an older child, sometimes that child will nap along with them. Um, and, you know, rest, space your activities out. Don't try and push yourself to get everything done. Um, for the nausea and vomiting, we've already talked about the crackers and the dry toast. Um, you can keep them close to your bedside table so that you can eat them before you get up out of bed. Um, several small meals throughout the day. Avoid anything greasy. Avoid anything um, real spicy. Um, nothing like real odorous like cabbage or Brussels sprouts unless it's what you're craving and it doesn't make you sick. Um, so those are some things that you could do. Moms in their third trimester commonly complain of backache. Um, so instead of telling them to take ibuprofen, I mean, Tylenol is generally considered safe, but other medications are not. Um, avoid standing or sitting in one position for a long time. You can use a heating pad on low for the small of your back. Um, support your lower back with a pillow when you're sitting. Uh, maintain good posture, and of course, you know, if your significant other can um, provide some help with massage, that's also good. Leg cramps. I don't think we really touched on leg cramps for the common discomforts of pregnancy, but in the second and third trimester, um, they are fairly common, like a charley horse. Um, you, you sometimes get them like in the middle of the night. Elevating the legs will help because that helps with venous return. Um, if you do get that charley horse, try and stretch it out, make that... Um, kind of flex your feet towards the body and that uh, elongates the calf muscle. Some people might need calcium supplements. Sometimes that calcium to phosphorus ratio gets out of whack. And so that might be something that they want to talk to their provider about, but I wouldn't go recommending it without them talking to the provider. Usually they'll say like Tums, um, which are pretty safe. Um, for varicose veins, that's another common thing that happens in pregnancy. Have the woman walk every day a little bit to sort of um, help with circulation. Don't stand in one spot for too long. Elevate your legs, you know, for about an hour above the heart level while you're resting. Don't wear anything real tight. 
don't cross your legs. And um, the woman might need to wear some support stockings like Ted's um, to help uh, return that venous circulation. Um, hemorrhoids. Hemorrhoids are a common discomfort of pregnancy. They typically occur late in pregnancy. You have the weight of the fetus. You have poor venous return. You have constipation. Um, so make sure that mom does whatever she can to avoid the constipation. Now, the prenatal vitamin can be kind of rough. It has a lot of iron in it. Um, so she might need to take something like a slow FE, which is um, a slower release iron preparation, doesn't cause as much constipation. Um, talk to her provider about that before she changes anything. And um, drink plenty of fluids, ambulate, fiber-rich foods, um, those kind of things. And if she does still get the hemorrhoids, the, she can use um, over-the-counter type preparations and the witch hazel pads, and that should help. Um, for heartburn, heartburn's you know very common complaint. We talked a lot about it. Nothing spicy, no, nothing greasy. Elevate your the head of your bed with a lot of pillows. Um, try not to lay down for two hours after you eat. Um, sometimes those sips of water will reduce the burning. Um, but you want to caution mom to watch the antacids. I mean, you know, they can kind of chew on tums a little bit, and there's some calcium in those, that which might help. Um, but you want to make sure that she's not doing a lot of aluminum-containing um, antacids, um, that kind of thing. And so those are some of the, the things that we can teach mom to do about the common discomforts of pregnancy. And then we get into other topics for self-care, um, talking about personal hygiene. Um, there's really not anything special. The only thing that um, a lot of moms will complain of increased vaginal discharge, and that's all part of the estrogen that sort of um, is flooding the body. The cervical and vaginal glands are producing more secretions. So mom is going to want to keep that area clean and dry, always going from front to back to prevent a urinary tract infection. Um, Tub baths are okay during pregnancy. You just want to watch mom getting in and out of the tub um, for falls risk. She, you don't want her to slip getting out of the shower. Um, the balance changes in pregnancy. It's like that lumbar lordosis. Your um, center of gravity changes. And you have that waddling gait and the loosening of the joints. And so mom is more prone to falls. So you want to make sure that anytime she's um, like getting in and out of the shower that she's okay. So as far as hot tubs and saunas go, they are like totally off the menu um, because they pose risk to the fetus. You can get fetal, fetal tachycardia and increased maternal temperature. And here we're not talking about a regular bath or even like the jacuzzi that we use in labor and delivery. We're talking about something that really elevates your temperature a lot, like a sauna would definitely. Why would you want mom to... Um, sweat out all that extra fluid that she kind of needs in circulation. Um, and like jacuzzis that you find in like hotels or, um, you know, hot tubs, they, you know, also increase the risk of um, introducing bacteria. So you want to avoid those. Okay. As far as dental care goes, um, mom is more likely to get that gingival hyperplasia, you know, she might have swollen gums. And we also want to encourage mom, um, for other reasons, to seek dental care, just as normal. Even um, dental x-rays are okay if she's shielded. But um, she'll want to go to the dentist because um, regular dental care is associated with lower risk of preterm labor. And I'm not sure I understand all the mechanism that goes behind this. I do know that um, regular dental care also is associated with lower risk of heart disease. And it's thought to be because, um, you know, that chronic inflammation in the gums, that little bit of inflammation sort of raises all those um, chemicals in the blood that, uh, you know, signal inflammation that can be associated with those, disease, with those diseases. Um, so dental care is important. Um, 
Also, if mom is vomiting or nauseous, she's going to need to make sure that she brushes her teeth with a soft teeth toothbrush after vomiting so she doesn't bathe her teeth in like that stomach acid. Um, avoid sugary snacks, floss her teeth daily. Good dental care really is associated actually with better perinatal outcomes. And like I said, I'm not sure I understand um, all of the mechanism behind it, but it does have to do with that low level of inflammation um, that occurs when dental uh, hygiene is poor and when, uh, when you get that little bit of gingivitis. Um, as far as exercise goes, a pregnant mom can generally do whatever she's used to doing. So if she tells you, you know, I want to run in a 5K, well, ask her, do you run in a 5K when you're not pregnant? This isn't the time to start anything really unusual, but moms can always be encouraged to exercise. They can walk. Um, they can do prenatal yoga, but you want to discourage them from doing um, postures that might make them more likely to um, fall or to um, sustain injury from those loose joints. Um, it's generally whatever mom is used to. And exercise can be helpful. It keeps mom from gaining excess weight. It helps her with her insulin um, metabolism. And um, it is associated with better outcomes with the baby as well. And one caution with exercise, you want to make sure that mom's not going to do anything that promotes her risk of injury or falls. So even if she's used to horseback riding or ice skating or something that's... Um, maybe a little bit more hazardous. You want her to avoid that. So like skiing, surfing, scuba diving, um, ice hockey, those kind of things would be, you know, sort of off the table for a little while. Snowboarding. Um, certain exercises are good for mom, for the discomforts of pregnancy. The pelvic tilt and pelvic rocking relieve backache. And uh, gentle stretching, low-impact aerobics, those kind of things generally tend to be beneficial. Okay, so in terms of sexual activity, um, there's usually no reason not to engage in um, sexual activity unless you have vaginal bleeding um, or placenta previa or preterm labor. Um, if you have cervical incompetence where you have a cerclage, if you have rupture of membranes or if you have any kind of infection, you would want to refrain from those things. And those things your provider would tell you. Um, but definitely any kind of vaginal bleeding. And most women have enough common sense to know that. Um, but the risk of, if you're at risk for preterm labor, you may be put on what's called pelvic rest, which is um, nothing in the vagina. So um, generally sexual activity is permitted. In certain cases, it may be prohibited. In terms of whether or not a mom can work, in most cases, mom can work throughout her pregnancy as long as her occupation isn't really hazardous. If she deals with chemicals or if she's exposed to radiation or um, infectious disease or if her work involves heavy lifting or climbing on ladders or um, any kind of prolonged standing, she may be at risk for complications. So um, her provider should, part of your assessment should be to find out what she does when she goes to work and whether there are any hazards. You want to make sure she's not exposed to any occupational hazards or employment. Um, you know, nurses are notorious. We're exposed to viruses. We're exposed to bacteria. We're exposed to, um, you know, formal, formalin, um, radiation, all kinds of things that um, can sometimes be hazardous. Um, so mom needs to know how to protect herself from those hazards. And as far as travel, in the first and second trimesters, if everything is going well, um, most moms can travel. In the last trimester, um, you might want to limit where, <clears throat> excuse me, where you travel. Especially if there's any kind of complications, you really don't want to be somewhere where you can't get care. Um, and you want to be kind of mindful if you are at risk for anything, if you have uh, any kind of gestational hypertension, if you have gestational diabetes or any other type of diabetes, if you have preterm labor, if you have a high risk pregnancy, um, you want to make sure that your doctor knows what your travel plans are before you do it. Uh, if you're traveling by plane, usually you can go up to like the eighth month, they generally say, but always consult with your healthcare providers and traveling overseas may be, um, a problem. You might have problems with access to care. 
Um, and you might also have problems if you're traveling in a prolonged, really shouldn't be um, driving for prolonged periods or um, engaging in air travel unless you can get up and move around just because of the risk of um, deep vein thrombosis. Okay, so another thing that mom needs to be educated about in terms of self-care um, are the need for like a flu shot. Um, influenza vaccine is not contraindicated in pregnancy. We want moms to get flu shots. Um, we want her to get Tdap generally. Let me put those down there. Um, Tdap is tetanus, diphtheria, and um, pertussis. And we want mom to get the Tdap vaccine to protect the baby against pertussis particularly um, because it's made a resurgence in some areas of the country. Babies can't get the Tdap vaccine until about they're about two months old, and not everyone has good immunity to these uh, diseases, especially whooping cough. Their immunity wears off over time. So if we can uh, vaccinate mom while she's pregnant, baby gets a passive transfer of antibodies through the placenta and is protected. And because Tdap is not a live vaccine, it's safe. Now there are vaccines that are contraindicated. Um, and one of them is the influenza nasal spray because that's a live vaccine. Anything that's live, you really don't want to give. So you don't want to give that. You don't want to give the varicella vaccine. That is also a live vaccine, live attenuated vaccine. And so baby could get like a case of congenital varicella um, from that. Remember that mom is immunocompromised. So if you're injecting her with a live virus vaccine, um, the baby can get that. For the same reason, we don't want to give the NMR, which is measles, mumps, and rubella. That is also a live vaccine, and we really don't want the baby to be exposed to that because congenital rubella uh, can cause serious congenital problems in the child. And um, also along those lines, we don't want to give the meningococcal um, or the typhoid or the BCG. And BCG in this country is not common. Um, but the meningococcal vaccine may be sort of more common. Um, so those are some vaccines that you don't want to give in pregnancy. And let me wipe some of that out. And we can talk about medications. Now, while I'm erasing, um, generally speaking, mom is not going to take medications without her provider's blessing. Any over-the-counter herbal um, prescription, anything. Really, um, there are lots of medications that can cause problems. So, um, we talked about pregnancy categories. Category A is generally regarded as safe. The further you go down the alphabet, the more risky it gets. B um, are used, category B are used frequently during pregnancy. Um, these are widely used, um, do not appear to cause problems. Category C, more likely to cause problems, but the benefits outweigh the risks. Or you use them if the benefits outweigh the risk. And there's category D, and these are known to cause problems. And these might be things like um, lithium or anticonvulsants like dilantin. Category X, remember I said the further you get down the alphabet, they skip a lot of letters to get all the way down to X. And these are um, medications that are associated with... Um, they have clear-cut association with fetal um, birth defects. So things like Accutane um, Coumadin, yeah that was another one, right? ACE inhibitors 
sulfonamides, and other some other antibiotics. Tetracycline, I think, but it wasn't really serious. Um, radiation therapy. These things are all category X, and this is when we talk about why it's important for all nurses to know um, something about maternity to help them practice. If, you, if you're seeing patients in other settings, you need to know um, medications that are likely to cause problems and be able to say, you know, I'm not sure that this person should be on it. And for the most part, when you see things like um, Coumadin is never given with pregnancy. ACE inhibitors are never given. They're not supposed to be given to women um, with any, uh, who are of childbearing age of all. Accutane should not be given to women. They usually have to sign a waiver and they have to agree to go on birth control pills or get depo Prevera or something like that. Um, okay, so those are the medication categories. But generally speaking, make sure that you assess mom's use of over-the-counter remedies, make sure that you know what herbal preparation she's taking, and make sure that she has the education she needs to stay safe. Okay, so we also wanna make sure that mom is well-educated about the danger signs in pregnancy. And some danger signs in pregnancy might include vaginal bleeding. Um, bleeding is never really reassuring in pregnancy, although 10% of women have some episodes of bleeding during pregnancy. Um, it's always something that the provider needs to know about. Um, so vaginal bleeding, how about a leaking of fluid from the vagina? Um, and that's usually associated with rupture of membranes, although sometimes women will think that they've ruptured membranes when in fact they just have increased vaginal discharge. Um, so that's leaking of fluid from the vagina. Um, certainly a dangerous sign. And when we cover high-risk pregnancy, we'll talk more about that. They should also know that decreased fetal movement is a warning sign in pregnancy. Um, fetal movement is probably one of the most reliable indicators of fetal well-being. Moms who come in and say the babies don't move frequently, um, it, they should really report, be taught to report that right away and take it seriously. Um, because um, when you ignore it, sometimes you end up with a fetal demise. Maybe you could have delivered that baby and helped them. Um, not that you should ever tell a mother that there was anything that they could have done differently in that event. Just want to educate them for the next pregnancy to really know um, to be aware of fetal movement. Um, you also want to teach mom about the signs and symptoms of preterm labor. And preterm labor doesn't always feel like um, term labor. Preterm labor can be a backache that comes and goes. It can be aching in the thighs. And of course, women have that backache from the lumbar lordosis in pregnancy. Um, but this is a little different. This is sort of a crampy backache that doesn't change when the mom changes position, especially if it comes regularly. Um, mom should be really taught um, to report if she gets contractions, if she's preterm, if she gets contractions that are every 10 minutes apart, um, regular, and they don't go away with walking. She really needs to, to call her provider. Braxton Hicks contractions happen towards the end of pregnancy, and a lot of women will confuse um, Braxton Hicks for true labor, but Braxton Hicks tend to last for only like a few seconds, and they tend to happen later on. But certainly if mom has any of those symptoms of preterm labor, she should report them to her provider. Um, severe headache. That doesn't go away with Tylenol or rest. Oh my goodness. Um, that can be a sign of preeclampsia. So we want her to report that. Um, so those are some signs and symptoms that we want mom to uh, report to her provider and that's part of her education. Towards the end of pregnancy we also want to encourage mom to take childbirth classes. Childbirth preparation classes used to be synonymous with um, unmedicated birth and that's no longer really the case. This is an education class about what to expect during labor and birth. 
Um, and so mom should know that it's still worth her while, even if she plans on giving birth with an epidural or with pain medication, other pain management. Um, but childbirth education does a lot more than uh, teach moms coping skills, although that is important, as we learned in Labor Support Lab. Um, childbirth preparation also um, talks to them about the environment in which they're going to give birth, things like what to expect with fetal monitoring, how to um, cope with labor, even with technology. Um, and it just gives them sort of a sense of competence and some anticipatory guidance, um, and it helps the partner know how to assist her. Um, I think I mentioned in Labor Support Lab, we were all kind of tired and it was the end of the day, um, that dad sometimes, it wasn't to the whole class, I think I said it to a few people, um, dad sometimes freaks out worse than mom when mom starts to be in pain. They're not used to seeing their partners in that situation. It is very uncomfortable for them, especially if they have not had the preparation. I really think it's important for, um, for the main support person to go through some sort of preparation um, so that they can assist the mom. If mom starts to moan, if mom starts to cry, if she starts to say, I can't do this, he needs to, he or, you know, whoever the support person is, it could be a friend, a sister, um, a same-sex partner, a mom. It could be anybody who's there to support that person, but that person really needs to know um, how to give some comfort and how to accept the fact that um, moms can labor with some discomfort. And if they don't plan on getting an epidural, we don't have to fix the pain other than help mom cope with it. Um, and so childbirth education classes are really important. They also usually cover some breastfeeding preparation if mom is, you know, wants that. Um, and they can teach some basic infant care skills. So that's important as well. Okay, so we're on our last topic, which is nutritional needs in pregnancy. Um, we're going to discuss how to meet them and how to teach mom about them. Um, nutritional needs in pregnancy... Are interesting. Um, mom only needs about 300 additional calories a day, which really is not a whole lot of food. But the food that she is getting needs to be of extremely high quality. Um, moms need more calcium. Let's start writing here. Now your book kind of breaks it down a little bit differently. Um, and we can look at that in a little bit. But the average is about 300 calories per day. She has increased needs for calcium, increased needs for iron, increased needs for protein. Of course, we all know about folic acid. Um, moms also need vitamin D. Okay, so you're starting to see why that prenatal vitamin takes on a significance. For 300 extra calories, she's got to be a really um, healthy lady to get all of these um, nutrients in her diet and um, not gain extra weight. Okay, so uh, the prenatal vitamin is of a lot of significance. We've already talked about... Um, weight gain in pregnancy. And we know that the underweight woman who's BMI less than 18.5 needs to gain 28 to 40 pounds. It's in the last video, so you can look it up there um, or in your textbook. Normal weight, which is your BMI between 18.5 and 24.9. Your normal BMI lady needs 25 to 35 pounds. Um, overweight women need a weight gain of 15 to 25 pounds. Obese women need 11 to 20 pounds, so you might have to adjust those calories down. Um, if you're underweight, your risk is for a low birth weight baby, and so that woman needs extra calories. So she's going to need things like nuts and cheese and um, things that are a little bit more dense in, in calories. If um, you start out pregnancy and you're overweight, you have a risk of a high birth weight baby and a, risk of, a higher risk of gestational diabetes. You might have um, an increased risk of C-section. You don't want to diet during the pregnancy. You don't want to lose weight. That's never recommended. You don't want to severely restrict caloric intake. However, you might um, really want to restrict that weight gain to 15 to 25 pounds. And so those women should be eating more fruits and vegetables and lean meats um, or fruits. I mean, I'm sorry, or fish is what I meant to say. 
Um, the weight gain for the first trimester, I think, let's kind of talk about that. Let's do that. And, okay, so... For the normal mom, you're going to look at first trimester, and we did this during that exercise with the timeline. Um, is one to four pounds, and that's really going to be true for the overweight woman or the underweight woman too, because really, they're not so much putting on weight. The baby doesn't weigh hardly anything, but their breasts are getting bigger and they're putting on extra fluid volume. So that's where your one to four pounds come from. Um, underweight women can gain about five pounds. Overweight women should gain about two pounds, but you're going to be roughly in that area. Nobody's going to do um, anything really crazy there. During the second and third trimesters, your normal lady... Um, is going to gain about a pound. Per week. Um, so that's your second and third trimesters really. Okay. Um, overweight women are probably going to gain about two thirds of a pound a week. So you're just adjusting, um, and you're watching and making sure that that overweight woman stays within her weight range. The underweight woman gains a little bit more than the normal weight. It's usually one pound per week in the second and third trimesters. Um, you want to be, you want to honor cultural traditions with food and just make sure that, um, Foods that are uh, associated with different um, foodborne illnesses are avoided, and we're going to talk about them a little bit. So let's get rid of that. Certain foods should not be consumed in pregnancy. We're going to talk about the um, unpasteurized cheeses or soft cheeses. So things like brie cheese feta, um, goat's cheese, anything real soft like that, you're going to caution people away from unless it's um, pasteurized. You want to avoid deli meat in general. There's a risk of listeria, which is uh, associated with stillbirth. So deli meat, unless you cook it and heat it to a temperature of 160. I don't know about you, I don't like to cook my deli meat. Um, so I just did without it. You want to watch certain fish. Fish that are high in mercury. Let me just get rid of this. Seafood twice a week is okay if it's on the low, um, if it's on the safe list. But you want to avoid um, tile fish, swordfish, um, Tuna you want to limit, albacore tuna, I think, you want to limit. Um, whereas they say that, like, salmon is safe, flounder, um, cod is generally safe. Um, but basically, you want to avoid those bigger fish. Shark is definitely off the menu. Mahi mahi, um, okay, so most of you, most of your fish is safe, but certain fish, just know like tilefish, swordfish, um, anything that's really high in mercury is off the menu. Um, so there's that. You want to make sure that, um, mom is handling her food correctly. Um, making sure she's cooking meats to the proper temperature. All poultry and pork should be cooked to the proper temperature. She's more susceptible to foodborne illness at this point. 
Um, so that's really about food safety. Of course, she's not going to consume any alcohol. Um, you know, you, when you counseled her to avoid alcohol, cigarettes, all that stuff. Um, so there's that. We need to address PICA. Um, PICA is a common problem, and it's associated with iron deficiency anemia a lot of times. PICA is eating things that aren't food. And it's really common during pregnancy, especially like I think down south they say it's very common. The common things that people eat are soil or dirt. I can't imagine, but they do. Clay, ice, and laundry starch. Um, I had a patient once who had a big box of Argo cornstarch, and she would just eat it by the spoonful, and you'd think, oh, my God. Um, it's really, really not good, and it's devoid of all nutrients. Um, it replaces iron-rich foods. It leads to deficiencies. It replaces protein in the diet. Um, and the provider really needs to know if that woman has PICA so that they can um, order the right test. You want to make sure she's not iron deficiency anemia. So those are nutritional needs. So what are some good sources of food um, during pregnancy? So, um, oh, hold on. Some good sources of food in pregnancy um, include um, fruits and vegetables, obviously. Um, especially the green leafy vegetables, dark green leafy vegetables or deep yellow vegetables. Um, vegetables are always good. Um, legumes, rich sources of folic acid. They're also um, a little bit higher, high in iron. They're very high in fiber, which helps mom with um, her digestive issues. Um, low fat or non-fat dairy. Uh, always a good option. Gives calcium, gives protein. Mom needs about the equivalent of four glasses of uh, non-fat milk a day from um, low-fat or non-fat dairy sources. It can be yogurt. It can be um, low-fat cheese. We really want to discourage mom from eating a whole lot of cheese, though, because it is constipating. So um, if mom's experiencing uh, constipation as an issue, we might want to steer her away from that. Um, lean protein. Uh, legumes are also a good source of lean protein, but um, those safe fish that we talked about, like your um, flounder and salmon, um, those are fairly safe. Uh, you also can in, you know, include poultry. Um, make sure that you cook everything to the right temperature. So um, lean protein. You can encourage mom to eat some nuts. You just want her to not eat them in excessive quantities because she'll gain weight. Uh, so those are good sources of nutrition. Eggs, um, they're high in iron. These are just um, some foods that you want to encourage mom to eat while she's pregnant. Um, okay, so I think that concludes our um, nutrition topic, which is the last thing we had to talk about. I'll see you guys in class on Thursday.